All right, so today we are uh, taking a break from our, our preaching series of Hebrews, and we're coming actually not to read in Matthew, but to read on 2 Timothy chapter 1. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. This is the passage that we're going to preach on today. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And if you're there with me, I invite you to stand as uh, I read God's word. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us the spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Let us pray. Father, we give thanks to you for your word. May you bless your word even as now we hear the truth that is being preached, that your spirit will work in us and among us, uh, that you would apply the gospel to our hearts. And pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. It's my joy to see all of you here today, and indeed, uh, we come to a passage today to talk about mothers, uh, because we are uh, indeed talking about Mother's Day, and the topic of my sermon is the faith of mothers, and particularly, uh, we want to talk about the faith of mothers and how it shapes the believers of the next generation. Now, I'm very aware that not all of us here are mothers, and some of us will never be mother, including me. Uh, but as we shall see right, in this message, there will be an uh, application for all. And as we come to see, really, uh, a Mother's Day's message is not just for mothers, but it's indeed for everyone. And so we would come to think about Mother's Day. If you search the internet today, and especially in the social media today, right, you will see a lot of inspiring stories about motherly love. You, will, you would see mothers who would sacrifice for their children. You would see mothers who would uh, take a hit, you know, who was struggling with uh, to save their children from alligators and so on. There's all kinds of inspiring stories about mothers. And even when there are exceptions, as it, and they surely are, and we'll talk about the exceptions later, but it's almost universally acknowledged that one of the greatest moments of human tenderness and human strength comes from great mothers who love their children well. Comes from great mothers who want to give whatever that they can for their children. And I think all of us wish to have that kind of mothers. Um, and, and this mothers would not be a mother who is always controlling, right? It's, always, it's also a mother who knows when is a good time to give freedom, when is a good time to give advice, when is a good time to love them and sacrifice for their children. And all of us wish to, be, to have that kind of mothers. And in turn, when we grow up, if you have the chance to become a mother, all of us wish to be that kind of mothers to others as well. So in the passage today, we want to look at some of the encouragement to those of us who are mothers and to what you're doing. But also, I think, to point to a greater reality that allows us to appreciate mothers and to love them well. Okay, so we'll look at three points. I don't have any slides that I have today, so it's just this, all right? But we'll look at three points, and I'll repeat them over again so that you would remember, right? The first is, for the mothers, your faith is remembered. Your faith is remembered. Second, your faith is passed down. Your faith is propagated. And finally, I think more importantly, your faith is not on you. Your faith is not on you, right? So let's look at the first point, right? Uh, your faith is remembered. Now, if you look at the passage that we've just read, 
You look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. If you exclude the greetings, right? Paul has greetings from chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. If you exclude the reading, greetings, there's a word that pops up very frequently. It pops up four times in five verses. And you know what word that is? That word is remember, right? And in the English, it appears to be two words. It's remind, reminded, remember. But in the Greek, it really is one root word, right? It comes from one single root word. And Paul is writing to, rem- to Timothy, as he's writing to Timothy, he's remembering him. He is reminded of who he is. And he reminds him, even to fan into flame, the gift that God has given to him. And so Paul is recalling Timothy. He's putting Timothy in his forefront of his mind. Who he is, what he did. And dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, one of the things, the main things, that Paul is reminded of Timothy is his faith. I will read that. Here. It is his faith that is reminded. And, and, and when he's thinking of Timothy, he probably, he, he's probably thinking of how Timothy has trusted God as a pastor in Ephesus. Timothy was young. He was not inexperienced, but to a people at that age, your age really speaks a lot. Right? And when you're young as a pastor in Ephesus, you know, it's, there's a lot of challenges that awaits you. So he thinks of Timothy, of his faith, as he faced all the challenges of people who might despise him. He thinks of this faith of Timothy as he deals with false teachers that comes into Ephesus and how Timothy deals with them with gentleness. He thinks of Timothy as setting an example in speech, faith, actions, love, and purity, even as he is young among all the people in Ephesus. And here's what he says in verse 5. Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Now, it's interesting, is it not, that when Paul is reminded of Timothy's faith, he naturally gets reminded of his mother and his grandmother, right? And I always, every time I read this in the Greek, it cracks me up because grandmother in Greek is literally mommy, right? So he's reminded of his mother and his mommy, right? And, and really, uh, his outworking of his belief, right? Paul is reminded of these two women. The impact of these two women on the faith of Timothy must have been huge, must have been great in his life. And we know from Acts 16, when Paul first met Timothy, Timothy was introduced as the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So we don't know if Timothy's dad was ever a believer, but really there grew, he grew up in a cross-cultural household, right? They're of probably very different race, right? Greek father, uh, Jewish mother, and then he grew up in this household. He wasn't converted by Paul. When Paul saw him, he's already a believer, his mom was already a believer. His grandmother was already a believer. And, he, and so he grew up in a Christian household. I know a lot of us here grew up in Christian household. But you see, Paul was so impressed by him. Presumably, he's impressed by him by his faith, how he trusted in God, not just the God of the Old Testament, but in Jesus Christ. And he wanted to bring Timothy along right after meeting him. Right after meeting Timothy, he says, you know what, I'm, I, wanna, I want you to come with me. And so we ask the question, how did his faith grow? How did Timothy, his, his dad probably not a believer, but how did Timothy's faith become so strong? And we come to this conclusion that really, I think his mom and his grandmother shown him how real their faith truly is. And the thing here is, as Paul is reminded of the faith of Timothy. He's not just reminded of his faith. He's reminded of the faith that dwells in the mothers and the grandmothers. And so for the moms who are here today, I want to encourage you that your faith in God today matters. Your faith in God today would be an influence to your kids. How you trust in God and who he is and what he does will be a huge influence to your children. And you know what? A lot of the times, I believe, even as Timothy, 
was growing up, a lot of the times the faith that he see in his mother is not directly taught. The mom probably never sit down and go in through a theological class and teach him about the faith. No, there are places where we do that, right? There's catechisms we go through. In fact, the kids are doing catechism right now over in the other room. But most of the time, faith is caught rather than taught, right? They're caught in your responses to its crisis, your reactions to its things, your responses when you're joyful. Do you trust in God? Do you pray to God? Do you pray to God? And you know that if we look back into church history, there is a lot of great history examples, right? I'm going to point to you one of the greatest ones, and if you know even a tiny bit about church history, you know this one, right? And this one is Monica, who is the mother of St. Augustine, right? And St. Augustine is the church father in the 4th century, very famous. And the reason why we know about Monica is because he wrote a lot about her in the Confessions. And if you have not read the Confessions, I encourage you to read the Confessions by St. Augustine. Great book, right? And Augustine grew up, right? He was, he, even though his mother was a pious believer, he was wayward. Right? He was all over the place. He lived a licentious life. At one point, he had an illegitimate child with his mistress, right? So travel all over the place, very brilliant, but very wayward, very licentious. And so his mom was following him the entire time. His mom was praying for him with tears. His mom comes to the churches where he is at, talk to the bishop. In fact, this is what, what one of the bishops said to the mom. The bishop said, it is not possible that the son of so many prayers and tears should be lost. Now, eventually, Augustine converted and became a Christian, became a fervent teacher. Of course, we know that it's God's grace that come upon him. It's God's grace that has chosen him to be his children. But the influence of his mom, too, has been a crucial part of what God has worked through. You see that? And we not only look at church history example in, in the past, I think of my own mother and I grew up in a pastoral house household. My dad's a pastor for as long as I could remember. And if you know any, anything about pastor's family, not just here, but all over the world, if you know anything about pastor's family, uh, we are not rich. We don't have a lot of money. You can ask Pastor Ben. He would testify to that. And, and uh, my mom has a lot of siblings, right? And they, they earn much more than her. Right? And, and there were times when we went into family troubles and my aunts and uncles would complain, right? You know, we don't have money, you know, there's enough money to do this, you know, there's money to do that. And in my entire life, I've never, until now as I was reflecting, as I was preparing sermon, I've never heard my mom said, we don't have enough money. I've never heard her say that. She never once sit down and tell me, you know what, boy, I'm, I'm going to tell you we don't have enough money because I believe in God, because I believe that God has everything. She never sat down and told me that. But I knew, and I caught it, and I experienced it, and I feel it. And I know that she believed that her dad owns everything. Not just her physical dad, but her spiritual dad owns the whole world. That's why she doesn't worry. That's why she could say, we don't, sh she never say, we don't have enough money. You see, when you lived out your faith as a mother, your children will catch it. They will see it. And your faith will be remembered. The example reminds us in real and tangible ways of how to trust God in times of need. That's the faith that Paul remembers of Eunice, of Lois, and of Timothy. Right? That's the first thing. Your faith is remembered. Now, more than being remembered in their faith, I think there is... Another theme that runs through 2 Timothy in these verses, right? And that theme is the passing down of a living faith. The passing down of a living faith. In, in fact, it, it's, it's throughout the book. If you read 2 Timothy, Paul is going to die soon. He said, I'm, my life is being poured out. I'm going to die. And, and at the forefront of his mind, he knew that he had to write to Timothy to pass down the faith. It's so important to continue on to propagate and to let this faith grow. 
You see in verse 1, 3, in chapter 1, verse 3, right? It says, the God whom I serve as did my ancestors, right? He's pointing to a tradition that he didn't start, but it's something that he gotten from someone else, from his ancestors. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, is, we, are, we come to this famous verse, every time you're discipling, you're making, peop- you're, you're making disciples, whether it's campus ministry, whether it's here, we always come to this chapter, right? Chapter 2, verse 2, what you have heard from me in front of all these witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You see, from Paul to Timothy, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. There's four generations of people there. Paul is very concerned with the passing down of faith. And then in chapter 3, how are they to pass this down? Paul says, it's through Scripture. There will be persecution, there will be false teaching, but it's through Scripture, which is God-breathed, profitable for the man of God, for the training of righteousness, and all that in it, it's in the Scripture that his faith is being passed down. And in chapter 4, we see Paul says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, if you come back to chapter 1 again, the fact that Paul here, very interestingly, he mentioned not just a faith that dwelt in your mother, Eunice, but his faith that dwelled in your mother, Eunice, but first dwelt in Lois, right? What does he bring up Lois? Because there's a generation there. Lois, down to Eunice. Eunice, now down to Timothy. You see how this theme goes through the entire book? It's about the passing down of a living faith. And the reason why, brothers and sisters, why this is even possible, why is it that this faith could be passed down, is because it's a living faith. It's not just a faith that is dead. It's not a faith that is dead like what James said, if your faith, you say and you confess in your faith, but you have no actions, your faith is dead. It's not a dead faith. It's a living faith, and a living faith will grow. And when the faith is living, it will be passed down. It will influence others. It will affect others. And so how do we know it's living? Well, Paul chose the word. He says what? A faith that dwelt in your heart. This word, right, means to make its home. This faith comes in here. It dwells in it, makes this whole place its home. And in fact, in a couple of verses down the, r- down the line, you see 1 chapter 14. Paul describes the Holy Spirit as dwelling, the same word, dwelling in the believers. Faith makes its home in the hearts of this believer. And it's a living faith and it grows. And it's a faith that's not just concerned with what you know in your head. Because a lot of times when we talk about faith today, we talk about theological knowledge. We talk about the knowledge of the Bible. We talk about how much we know and we go through Sunday school and we go through preaching. Right? But it's not just a faith in the, heart, in the head, but it's a faith of heart desires that you would desire Jesus. You would love him. You would want to put him as a priority. And not just that, but it's a, it's a faith that is affecting your hand actions. Right? That you would go out and be committed to him to do things and serve him and love God and love others well. It's a full orb faith that bears fruit. And I don't, I, I don't want to uh, overstate it, but here, as this faith is lived out, it's passed down, and Paul is saying this is a crucial, crucial thing. It's one of the most important things that you could do as a Christian generation. So here today, mothers, I want to encourage you that your faith is passed down, primarily now to your children if they are young, especially because they are young, because they are your primary concern. And this is the crucial task that Paul writes about it. And why is this such an encouragement? Because so many times we live in this world, the world doesn't see it that way. The world doesn't see motherhood as that important. If your primary job is taking care of your kids, your economic productivity in the eyes of the world is negligible, right? You don't get paid for taking care of kids. You don't get paid for raising children. Right? And in many ways, I think we fall prey to this definition, right? We think of taking care of kids as a glorified babysitting, 
and we have a hierarchy of babysitting, you know, like how, how at, at the bottom of it, really babysitting is such, is such, a, such a thing that, you know, nobody wants to do. We, sometimes we fall prey to that identity. We feel that this is, what we're doing is not worthwhile. And the Bible tells us no. The passing down of your faith is one of the most important things you can do. Motherhood is one of the most significant things that you can, have, uh, can ever occur to you. And look at Paul, right? In his dying letter that he's about to die, the concern is about passing down this living faith in the head, hearts and hands. And so mothers, what you do in nurturing your children is way more important and significant than you can ever imagine. It's an encouragement to you those of us who are mothers or those of us who would be mothers one day. Now, if I end my sermon here, some of you who are mothers or some of you would be mothers would be very inspired. Right? You would say, well, I see you know, how this is such an important task, so significant, I go back, I would do it again. Or if you're preparing to be a mother in the future, you would be like, yes, I, you know, this is some glorious thing that I would do. I would go and do it. Right? And you want your faith to be remembered. You want your faith to be passed down. And it's true, and it's all true and good. Some of you will be very inspired, but some of you would be very crushed. Right? You think about Monica, and you say, how in the world can I do that? How can I persevere with my kids? How can I have so much responsibility upon me and still take care of my kids? In fact, if, if you've been hearing me say, maybe some of you, is, it's really painful for you to hear what I've said in the first two points because it's already hard enough that you're bringing them to church. You're already struggling. And there's so many times when you feel like a failure because you're, you're, you don't feel that you're a good mother your children. And if I end here too, some of us would think that today's message has got nothing to do with me because I'm not a mother, nor will I ever be. But then all of us would be missing the point. All of us would be missing the point of this Mother's Day's message. What's the point? Well, let me back it up a little bit. Right? Uh, if you listen to Z88.3, and I do sometimes on the car, listen to it. And uh, there's this guy who comes on with a very deep voice, right? Uh, his, his name is Steve Brown, right? And uh, he has this little segment called You Think About That, dot com, right? And uh, yeah, I know some of you <laughs> have, read, have heard that, right? And so uh, this is from a long time ago, and he says this, right? And I'm just using it as an analogy. He says, you know what? When you look, when you find, when you try to pursue happiness, Normally, you don't directly pursue happiness, right? I mean, happiness is not something that you directly pursue. You don't say, well, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, and then you go and want to be happy. No, happiness comes really as a, most of the time, actually, happiness comes as a side effect of doing something that you enjoy, right? Whether when you go to watch a movie, you I engage in deep relationship with your parents, with your spouse, with your friends, or you go for a vacation, or you do, you do other things, right? And then happiness comes. And what's the point? W when you really focus on happiness, you normally don't get it. You normally miss it, right? Now, in the same vein, come back to this message, right? Mother's Day's message, if we only focus on the mothers, you will normally miss it. Mother's Day's message is only meaningful and encouraging, I believe, when the mothers are not at the center. When the mothers are not at the center. Why do I say that? Look at the greater context of 2 Timothy. Paul knew the importance of remembering faith. Paul knew the importance of propagating the faith. But you know what? He kept the main thing, the main thing. Right? He kept the main thing. What is the main thing, you say? What is this whole thing that Paul is really drumming in into Timothy? The mothers is just a side note. And the main thing we find in chapter 2, verse 8, this is what Paul says. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus 
with eternal glory. Dear mothers, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, the reason that motherhood has value, the reason that passing down to the faith is significant, and the reason that your work as a mother is not in vain, is not because what you have done or what you can ever do to your children, but because of what, of what God has done to you and of, God, of what God is doing to your children and of, God, of what God will do to you and your family. You see, mothers, your faith is remembered, your faith is passed down, but most of all, your faith is not on yourself. Your faith is on Jesus Christ. And when we do that, when we focus our attention to Jesus Christ, and when we realize that this is the object of our faith and not ourselves, that's when we have the joy to live out to being a good mother, that's why we have the courage to admit failure and say, I failed as a mom in some ways, but I can be strengthened again in my God. You see, the promise of life to your children is not in you. Look at even the first verse in 2 Timothy. It says what? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life, the gift of grace is from Christ. In fact, that's what makes your faith precious. What makes your faith precious is not how fervent you believe in it. It's not how sincere you are. But really, what makes your faith precious is the object of your faith. It's the God whom you trust. So even when you have failed to be a good mother. And I'm not just talking about I'm not just talking about your son you, you trip up and you shout it at your son or you, you know, lose your temper and throw a tantrum at your children when they're bad. I'm not just talking about that when I say failure. And I'm saying failure even from ranges from maybe you have a heart you want to you want to be a mother, but right now biologically you can't. Or maybe some other Mothers here have gone through, because of various circumstances, abortion. When we have failed to be mothers in those very significant ways in our lives, the invitation today, dear mothers, is for you to place your trust in God and rest in Him and not in your own work. Yes, do all that you can, but rest in Him. Trust in Him. That's why Paul says in verse 8, that we are to share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Failure is the suffering that we have to endure as a mother. And that's what we have to do. So even as we fail that as, as a mother today, the invitation for you is to trust in Him, to put your faith in Him. And if you are doing a good job, if you think that, you know, I'm nurturing my children, they're passing down my faith, remember that it's not you who are doing it, but God working through you. God is working through you to raise up your kids. And you are but an instrument used in his kingdom for his glory in his plan. So you see, when we really realize the center of the gospel, there's no place for pride and there's no place for despair. Because why? Because in the gospel, God gave us spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That's the promise that we have in the gospel. And that's the promise that we have as we raise our kids. Now, what about our identities as children? All of us can be mothers, right? But at some point in our life, all of us have mothers. Some of us have mothers like Eunice and Lois. We thank them, right? We thank them for passing down that faith to us. They, we grew up in that household. They teach us the faith. They don't only teach us the faith. They lift out the faith so that we can catch it from them and understand from them. But when we focus our faith not on our mothers but on Christ, this is also how it applies 
to us. When we focus on Christ and the gospel, we thank our mothers, but our faith are not on them. We don't have to blame them when they fail. We don't have to expect of them perfection when they're not perfect. So some of us have mothers that are good, but some of us have mothers who are less than ideal, maybe very much less than ideal, right? From helicopter parenting tiger moms, right? All the way to abusive mom, whether it's physical or... And, and we live in a world where there's all kinds of sin and the general rule don't apply. And when we know our mothers are not at the center of our lives, but Christ is... Jesus Christ is, and Jesus Christ has loved us more than our mothers ever could. More than our mothers have ever given all the sacrifices to us. But Jesus Christ gave his life for us, sacrificed for us, would go to hell and back for us. When we realize that, then we are free to love our mothers who are full of flaws. We are free to appreciate them. We are free to come to them and say, even though they have failed us, but from our deepest heart, the source of our love is not from them, but from God, because He has first loved us. And so we are free to pray and to hope that one day reconciliation indeed can occur if you are in tension with your mothers. Because why? Because Jesus Christ has come and He has broken through this barrier of man and God. And so today is Mother's Day, and, and, and I really think it's appropriate for us to celebrate the love of our mothers, for our mothers. But I think it's even more important to weigh our mothers in light of the love of Jesus. And to know that the faith that we have, the faith that is remembered, the faith that is passed on, is a faith that is not on us, but ultimately is a faith that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. So to those of us who are mothers or would-be mothers, may the love of Christ compels you to demonstrate a faith in Him, a faith that can be seen by your offspring for God's glory. For those of us who are children, may the love of Christ compels us to trust in Him and to see our love for our mothers in light of Him. Let us pray. Father, we come before you and we give thanks to you because, Lord, you have loved us more than our mothers ever could. You have loved us and given us your only begotten son. You have crossed the boundary between creature and creator. And you have come into this world, born in a manger, died for us on the cross. So that we would be your children. So that we would be touched by your love so that we would have this love to love the people around us, some of them who are really hard to love. Lord, even as I think of them, even as we think of perhaps our difficult mothers, Lord, I pray that you stir in our hearts a love to remind us of how difficult we are for you to love, yet you have loved us. And let that love inspire us to love our mothers in the same way, to thank them, to appreciate them. And also for us as mothers, O oh Lord, let us love our children in the same way that you have loved us, with grace and compassion, with holiness and justice. And so, Father, help us today as we come to you and may the Holy Spirit work in us even as we leave from here that we would glorify you in all the things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.